So welcome to the lecture on psychiatry and pain. It's a big topic and the first place we're going to start is uh, to look at the word psych or psyche which comes from the Greek word soul or butterfly. Hence the butterfly in the bottom of your uh, slide. That was a dull color as well so we decided to make it sky blue for this presentation. Right, so this is the structure of the topic. Psychobehavioral assessment we'll have a look at and um, this is something you won't be needing to do on all your patients but if you get a patient that's um, the, the problem is based mostly in the psychological aspect or those big psych psychiatric um, issues then it's important to be able to do a basic psychobehavioral assessment or at least think about what you need to do. Um, we'll have a look at some psychiatric disorders and pain particularly depression, anxiety. Um, we'll talk briefly about the somatoform disorders because I find them quite confusing um, and personality disorders which are definitely a feature of pain clinics and pain clinic patients. So the psychobehavioral assessment. What is the aim? Why are you going to do this? Um, you th when you sit down and think okay there's something going on here that I need to delve into deeper or perhaps I need to uh, have another time where I can really focus on my psychobehavioral assessment, perhaps at another appointment. Um, what am I going to do? When am I going to do it? Well, and I'll go through each one in turn. Um, if you're going to assess a patient before you, 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 you do um, an advanced form of therapy, you might need a psychobehavioral assessment. Where are we? Um, are there any flags that we need to deal with? Um, the same thing you would be, you would do this after um, a particular treatment, how have they changed? Have they improved? Um, has anything that I've done had an effect? You're doing the assessment to identify any um, psychiatric flags, psychosocial flags, and of course the um, uh, occupational uh, vocational issues. So we've discussed the flags and the risk factors before. Um, another aim for, for the psychobehavioral assessment is to define whether somebody is actually suitable for an advanced therapy um, such as a pain management program, um, advanced treatments like spinal cord stimulators and even opioid therapy um, and you're assessing patients for the risks of opioids um, which is another topic in itself um, and the assessment, the psychobehavioral assessment can also be done for teaching or research purposes. So those are the reasons why you'd be wanting to do this assessment. How would you go about doing this assessment? Again, don't have to do it all, but this is the this is the the the, the comprehensive um, view on how you would do this. You would do a clinical history. You would um, look at a collateral history, examination of the patient psychologically, or that is, and you would do some psychometric measures or tests. So the clinical history, as we've discussed previously in the in taking the history in detail you would focus mainly on um, uh, psychiatric issues, you would focus on orange, yellow, blue and black flags. Of course with any patient you've got to consider the red flags and, and um, serious medical issues that need to be diagnosed but we're not going to focus on that. So, th so the orange and yellow flags um, when taking a clinical history thinking about depression and anxiety you're really going to consider um, each aspect of depression, each, at each aspect of, psycho of um, anxiety and try and tease out what's going on and see if, this, if you can find things to support your diagnosis. The collateral history can be done as well um, and this doesn't have to be done at the same sitting and this collateral history can be done from family members, um, work associates and of course that can be done by other members of the team or the team that you're involved with, so the psychologists, the psychiatrists, um, physios and occupational therapists. And then there is a psychobehavioral ex assessment from an exam perspective, so examining the patient and I, and this doesn't include the actual physical examination but this is, this is just some things that you would consider um, when assessing these patients. So let's change tact a bit and the first one are pain behaviors and you're going to be thinking about whether this patient is displaying pain behaviors or not displaying pain behaviors but the thing about pain behaviors is that you can have pain behaviors but no pain and of course you can have no pain behaviors and pain so it's important to realize that pain behaviors do not equal or do not confirm pain being present um, pain behaviors can be observed of course 
and you can document them and quantify them and that's quite important as well um, how do you do that well have a peek through your receptionist's um, window or office and see what the patients look like in the waiting room um, some of us bump into patients on the high street um, um, have a look at your patients when they come into the examination room so I go out and collect each of my patients walk them in have a look out of the corner of my eyes see how they're moving see how they react and um, deal with people around them and then the other way to assess pain behaviors is to get patients to fill in pain diaries now these are the pain behaviors um, you might find more more or less pain behaviors elsewhere but I thought I'd put them all together and you can um, have verbal or vocal pain behaviors so they sigh they groan they can catastrophize um, looking at the motor aspect you you can have um, grimacing limping they can hold themselves in un, in unnatural postures um, and of course protecting fear avoidance neglecting and immobilizing um, the limbs so I you see patients with complex regional pain syndrome not really using that arm not really using that leg not to say that they're displaying pain behaviors that you know there might be a reason for it but those are the kinds of things so the important thing is to tease this out Patients seeking help to, to reduce pain could be considered a pain behavior. Some people do do it far too often um, to far too many doctors as well. Um, repeatedly seeing doctors, repeatedly going to the EDs. Um, and this is a form of pain behavior. Um, of course, using protective devices, canes and collars and those kinds of things could be considered um, a, a, a pain behavior and taking sick leave yeah okay um, so the collars and the canes I, I went to a pain clinic a pelvic pain clinic a specialized pelvic pain clinic and I was quite interested to see what these patients would look like and how they would behave and the first patient that came in uh, came in on a wheel in a wheelchair she had dark glasses on and she had um, a, a cane when she when she got up because she could walk but she chose not to walk and um, she had a collar on as well and it was it was um, uh, fantastic this this patient displayed all the pain behaviors I was I had, I had a judgment and I was expecting to see somebody different with pelvic pain but she had abdominal pain she had pelvic pain and and this was the way she was relaying it to us functional limitations are another pain behavior so they um, they excessively rest they excessively do exercises and we can we'll be discussing those at a later point and then reinforcement as well so the pain behaviors can be reinforced by various surrounding issues now Waddell signs um, and as you can see from the reference this started in 1980 from Waddell who I think was a surgeon a spinal surgeon um, and we all have heard about them we all know about them but I'm going to spend some time on it because it's important to get a handle what it is and what it actually means um, because until I started reading about it I had a different view on what Waddell signs were so let's tell you what it is and all it is in its simplest form is it's a detection of non-organic or psychological component to chronic lower back pain that's it if there's nothing more there's nothing less to it all it is and I'll repeat it again it's a screen to identify patients it's a screen to help you identify patients who require further psychological assessment that's it Waddell signs have been misused in many instances um, particularly clinically and medico legally as well um, they've been completely misinterpreted you need at least three of the three positive um, three signs um, or three positives to have a positive Waddell signs um, it doesn't exclude organic disease so if you got it it doesn't mean you're you're crazy it doesn't mean um, there's nothing going on or this is just a psychiatric problem all it means is that um, further assessment needs to be done and it doesn't mean it's associated with secondary gain or malingering whether it be conscious or unconscious and it shouldn't be used in a medical legal context but I see patients all the time that have come to me from um, uh, insurance companies and um, come for various assessments and they've got Waddell signs plastered all over it and it, it's been used incorrectly um, and it's not a contraindication to surgery it doesn't mean they don't need surgery all it means is they need further assessment okay screening tool further assessment so these are Waddell signs um, there are five categories 
and the first one is the tenderness and the, the, the way they display tenderness. And the tenderness is superficial, it can be diffuse, it's non-dermatomal and non-anatomical. So it's a, it's, an, it's a different kind of tenderness that you'd, that you'd expect. Um, if you perform simulation tests, uh, you can get positives when you shouldn't actually be getting positives. So the classic two are um, when you axially load a patient very lightly or just rest your hand on the head and they complain of their back pain. It shouldn't happen, but it does. And the other one is when you simulate it, when you rotate the patient. If you rotate the shoulders and the pelvis, there shouldn't be any cause for aggravating, say, back pain. Um, but if you do these things, it does happen. They get pain. So these are positive Waddell signs. The other is a distraction test, and the classic is a straight leg raise test. As soon as you lie a patient down, you raise their leg. They're, they're in pain, and they're, dis they're displaying overreactions um, and various other things. But the way to actually check it is get them to sit before you get them to lie down. And while you're checking their hips or knees, do a straight leg raise test with the patient in a sitting position, a so-called slump test, to see if you can reproduce that pain. And you'll get an idea of where there's a lot of psychology coming coming with some of your patients. Uh, regional disturbances, as I've mentioned, they're non-anatomical, they're not dermatomal, they're just, it's, it's, it's one leg, it's one arm, it's the whole body, um, it's below a certain line. Um, and then, of course, they overreact, or they could overreact, they cry out, they collapse. We see that quite a lot. Doesn't mean they're Waddell sign positive, and of course, it doesn't mean they shouldn't have surgery. All it means is further assessment is needed. So the mental state examination, this comes back from our psychiatry medical school days or when some of us did some psychiatry work just when they'd completed their training. Um, and those are the way you can consider assessing your patient's appearance, behavior, conversation, affect, perception, etc. Um, their insight, judgment, and whether you've developed a rapport with your patients. So the mental state examination. And I'm not going to dwell too much on the mini mental status examination. There it is. You can find it pretty much anywhere. But it is important in the pain world, particularly if patients are taking large doses of opioids um, and other sedatives such as benzodiazepines and antineuropathic agents. This is going to affect their cognitive function. And if um, patients are driving, if patients are operating heavy machinery, or you want to show them that things are um, that things need attention, you could you could and should assess a mini mental state exam as well as in the ex and in an exam as well um, you may not need to do it but you could certainly mention it talk about it and say you know this patient's on more than 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent of opioid a day I fear that their cognition may be affected which is highly likely and I would do a mental state ex a mini mental status examination when I next see my patients to document this right Back to the psychobehavioral assessment, and there are many psychometric measures that you could do as well, and um, that will be discussed in another, in another topic, the topic on psychology. But one of the classic up current ones are the impact recommendations on um, clinical trials. And impact stands for the initiative on methods, measurement, and pain assessment in clinical trials. And those are the impact recommendations of their core um, measures. Um, and core domains. So those are the core domains, the seven core domains that should be assessed. We'll talk about that another time. Right, the psychiatric disorders and pain. Now, this is confusing. Psychiatric disorders can be caused by pain or lack of pain treatment. So pain can lead to psychiatric disorders. Um, psychiatric disorders can lead to reduced ability to tolerate the pain. And of course, they can coexist as well and um, and this is where it becomes very vague and hazy and that's why it's important to have a handle on psych problems so the psychiatric disorders according to the DSM um, the DSM 4 uh, divides it into five categories and um, you can see them on your page now axis 1 and 2 category uh, axis 1 and 2 are essentially the syndromes or the the, the diagnoses uh, axis 1 is the clinical syndromes, the depression, anxiety. And axis 2 for us is essentially the personality disorders. But the way DSM-4 works is um, that you've got the illness, the disorder, and how it's impacted on the patient by the patient and their lives. So what physical conditions make it worse, exacerbate it? Um, 
what kind of social stresses that actually uh, contribute to it or make their diagnosis worse. Um, you've got their impact, and that's the word. What impacts these um, problems and what their level of function is. Now, before I talk too much about psychiatry, here it is, the DSM-5. It's in development, and um, some have said uh, this is very keenly waited for by most psychiatrists, and the general chatter is very pe people are very excited about what's coming out. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of con um, controversial issues around the DSM-5. So when this comes out, things might change, or things will change. Now, let's spend a bit of time on depression. Um, when you look at papers looking at depression and pain and the prevalences, patients with depression get pain. They can have somatic complaints. And depending on where you look, you can get ranges between 15 and 100% of patients with depression have some kind of pain. And then patients with pain have depression. So this is a chicken and egg kind of situation. Patients with pain can have, up to about 50% of patients can have major depression. Those numbers are huge. So it's important to have a handle on this. Now, pain and depression, some say, are, are come from a common background. And there's certainly common features of pain and depression. And who knows, it might be, a pain and depression might be on a, on a, on a spectrum. Um, and as you can see, mood is common in both. A low mood is common in both. A reduced pleasure, so anhedonia, common. Definitely not sleeping or difficulties with sleeping, changing in sleeping pattern. Concentrations change. And suicidal thoughts and ideations can be present in both. So how do you tease out the difference? Well this is the DSM-4 criteria for depression um, and you need five or more in the previous two weeks, so quite a short period and there are lots of pros and cons to the DSM-4 um, diagnosis of depression. Some people use the ICD um, depre uh, classification of diseases. Uh, but we'll just use the DSM-4. Keep it nice and simple. I, I quite like it. Um, and these are the things that you need. So you need five or more. Depressed mood, diminished interest, weight loss, um, or weight gain, insomnia, hypersomnia, so changes in sleep, changes in psychomotor um, agitation or retardation, lack of energy, which is very common in both, Worthlessness, which is important. If your patients feel worthless, that puts them in a slightly higher bracket of um, worry for you. Um, they can't concentrate, and they've got thoughts of death and suicide. As I've said, five or more in a two-week period. So depression, and this is the important part for us, pain affects the ability to diagnose depression and to treat depression. So what that means is, um, and a lot of this happens a lot in primary care, looking at some of the papers, um, it's missed. Patients come in with somatic complaints, they come in with physical complaints, um, and GPs, primary care physicians, hospital doctors, so tertiary, tertiary physicians focus on the complaints and they don't actually diagnose the depression. So pain masks that and it, it interferes with the diagnosis, recognition and treatment. And of course, pain affects the outcomes in depression as well. So people with depression and pain have much poorer outcomes. Their depression is more severe. They're much more functionally limited. Um, they've got higher unemployment. And they use more opioids. And this is important because patients use opioids incorrectly um, as an anxiolytic, as a sedative. And this is page, these are patients with depression and pain. So these are the patients that need to be assessed for opioid risks before they get onto opioids. But I, we see it a lot, I see it a lot with patients coming in depressed, low mood, and they're on opioids, and they're using the opioids incorrectly. So, depression, depression affects clinical outcomes? Yes, we've mentioned that. Worse pain, more pain, greater pain, and it lasts for longer as well. And it's more difficult to treat. Um, and you've got to treat them both, and that is, that is the key. Um, and antidepressants do work for pain. We know that. The tricyclics work. Um, we're not sure about the SSRIs, and we could probably say no. Um, we're pretty sure about the newer ones, the SNRIs, so serotonin, noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, and then the NRIs, the noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, probably would work as well. Um, and, of course, they work for depression as well. So common treatments... Um, 
and it's certainly been shown that when you treat the depression per se the somatic complaints or pain problems can increase can can improve can improve now I'm going to briefly mention a bit about the neurobiology of depression because I find it so interesting. When I was in medical school, it was just about serotonin and noradrenaline. That was it. That's what caused it. You gave them a tricyclic um, or an SSRI, waited four to six weeks, and they would improve. But there's a lot more to it now, so I thought it important to share that with you. And the amine hypothesis still stands: serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine as well. Periaqueductal gray, um, rafe, uh, rostroventral medial medulla, um, important and common areas to pain and depression. But it takes four to eight weeks for the medication to work. And I'm sure you're aware when you start these patients on this medication, initially they can get agitated, jittery, like they've had a small serotonin surge. And that happens after a couple of days. So that the, amine hy the amines change quickly, but it still only takes. You know, a while for the medication to work and that might be because there are other um, causes of the depression and that would lead on to the neuroplasticity theory where this comes down to neurogenesis and synaptogenesis particularly in areas like the hippocampus and it has been shown that antidepressants exercise and other things such as sex um, can actually increase neuroplasticity which is all good of course and uh, reduce levels of depression um, and this might be a reason why it takes four to eight weeks a couple of months for these medications to work because it actually affects neuroplasticity and neural regeneration or neural generation and then the neural circuitry is another proposed theory and this is looking at functional imaging uh, looking at various aspects of the brain in patients with depression and without and they found common areas of overlap where there may be issues with um, uh, the, the actual circuitry. So the prefrontal cortex, motivation, the amygdala, emotion, hippocampus, hypothalamus, and the basal ganglia, for example, psychomotor retardation. So neural circuitry might be a, a possible cause of the depression or play a, play a part. Gliogenesis, well, we're all talking about glia at the moment because this is the way that we could actually not treat the symptoms of pain but if we could modulate glia then perhaps we could actually treat the the cause of pain so there's a lot of work going on to into glia but this also this also comes to to depression as well and glia gliogenesis may be reduced in patients with depression as well so watch this space there are other causes which i've briefly mentioned mitochondria cytokines even genetic um, polymorphisms causes of depression much different now to they were quite a while ago and then have a brief look at the treatment of depression and we're going to be doing this hand in hand with psychologist or psychiatrist particularly psychologist psychiatrist oh, no, I don't say particularly they're both important if you're going to deal with the medication then you're probably going to have a psychiatrist to guide depending on the, the type of depression of course but then the psychotherapy that comes with it would be managed and supported by a, um, a psychologist so that's the treatment of depression. Medication, psychotherapy work together. They're synergistic. You can't do one without the other. You shouldn't do one without the other. Now, 80% get improvement with treatment. 50% um, can get complete remission. But those numbers are not really fantastic. And it has been shown that a high percentage relapse. We've mentioned this before. takes months to work. And antidepressants, as we know, are useful for other um, other syndromes and just a reminder here that medication psychotherapy synergistic and it takes months to work you're focusing on a whole bunch of possible causes for the depression so don't just focus on the amines focus on the neuroplasticity the neural regeneration so get them to exercise and those other things um, again multimodal approach and then as I've mentioned Antidepressants work for other syndromes as well, anxiety, PTSD, obsessive compulsive, eating disorders. Now, I just want you to have a look at this slide for a second. Um, when I started my pain training, I never really thought about suicide. Had it, didn't have an idea on how to approach patients that came to me and said, I want to kill myself. Are they 
Is this a pain behavior? Are they just expressing their high levels of pain and anxiety? Or is this a true problem? Do I need to deal with this now? Um, this is a fairly famous painting um, on a suicide or a picture of a suicide. And some say that this might be an actual suicide. It does look pretty graphic. Um, and there are a couple of papers out there um, which I'll talk about in a second. But the thing about this is, and we've discussed this previously in assessing or doing a suicide screen, ask a couple of early questions. Are you thinking about it? Oh, you're thinking about it. What are you thinking about? Have you thought about it for a long time? Um, is this something that you would consider doing? Um, have you got the techniques to doing it? Have you planned it? Um, have you done your will? Have you written a letter? When do you plan on doing it? And as you go down your questions of screening, the more um, detailed they become, the more likely this, this is to be real. And I would recommend that um, you follow your pain clinic's guidelines on suicide. And every pain clinic should have one. What do I do? So this is a, this is a good paper. Um, it's one of the very few papers out there looking at suicide and chronic pain. And essentially, the prevalence is double that of the non-pain population. Double. 5 to 15% of patients have attempted it. Um, ideation occurs in 20% of patients, in 1 in 5 patients. I don't ask 1 in 5 patients, but I should, and I, I do now. Um, just, just glance over it. That might be important. You might save a life from it. And the important thing is that there are particular types of patients that are slightly high, at higher risk of committing or considering suicide. And the important ones are those that feel helpless and hopeless, um, can't get away from the pain, and um, they, the catastrophizers are definitely there as well. Now, anxiety. Intense, unpleasant, um, and it's a disproportionate response to a threat. This threat is an internal threat. It's not an external threat. So it's my worry for passing my exam, my worry for something coming up. This is the DSM for... Um, um, classification on how to diagnose anxiety and we've all got anxiety to a point but when does it become a problem it needs to be there for a long time more than six months and it needs to interfere with your function and that's important and that happens for most DSM criteria um, DSM diagnostic criteria not only does it interfere with function but it's not caused by anything else such as substance abuse so anxiety is excessive anxiety and worry so it's excessive worry can't control the worry and, and I, when I stat a few exams it was difficult for me to control my worry but really um, it, you can't control your worry and you've got three or more of those um, um, various symptoms so wound up tense easily fatigued or worn out can't concentrate irritable uh, st stress and tension in muscles and problems with sleep so anxiety and I would say that anxiety is incredibly important in pain patients. And I've always thought, yes, my patients may be depressed. But if you find out, about, if you ask them about anxiety symptoms, they've all got it. Who are the patients that need treatment? Do they all need treatment? So this is um, from a pain clinical update from the IASB Press. Um, and have a look at this comparison between chronic pain and the general population. Look at these the, the um, anxiety disorders and phobias. They are huge in the chronic pain population. They're almost double for the anxiety disorders, um, double for simple phobias. PTSD, is that three or four times higher I'm seeing there? Um, panic disorder is there, general anxiety disorder is double. So these things happen commonly in pain patients. Have a, have a handle on this. What am I going to do with these patients? The symptoms of anxiety, just for um, completeness, uh, I'll start with behavior, so BC, so behavioral, cognitive symptoms, and then physiological symptoms as well, and these are pretty much what we know already. But remember, pain is a feature of anxiety. That butterfly feeling, is that a, is that a kind of pain? Um, but certainly these patients can have pain. There are many tests to treat, uh, to diagnose or support your diagnosis for anxiety, and I'm not going to go into those right now. And there are mechanisms for anxiety, pretty much like there are mechanisms for, um, for depression, the psychological and biological mechanisms. And as you can see, there's a lot of work being done, and there's a lot of various um, possible causes. 
Now the treatments, again, like depression, psychologic, psycholo psych psychological treatment and pharmacological treatment must go hand in hand, otherwise it's not going to work. So these patients need to be able to recognize their symptoms, they need to manage their symptoms. They're part of um, a cognitive behavioral therapy approach. Um, and they can do this via various things, so relaxation techniques, central relaxation techniques, breathing techniques, uh, targeted muscle relaxation techniques. And this is the interesting one, systematic um, desensitization or graded exposure. So they're gradually exposed to their anxiety producing a situation or incident. And when they don't have any anxiety, they're exposed to it in a high level. So graded exposure, and that's part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's some good results coming, coming from this. Attention aversion, take my, take my mind elsewhere. And cognitive reappraisal, pretty much like what is the, one of the main um, aspects of CBT. Now the treatment, the pharmacological treatment, same thing. You get anxiolytics and analgesics. Um, some are only anxiolytic, some are only analgesic, but you definitely get a common uh, group of medication as well that treat anxiety and um, are analgesic. Antidepressants, anticonvulsants, particularly the newer gabapentinoids. Um, alpha-2 agonists, as I mentioned, the gabapentinoids, and geloxetine is definitely there as well now. You've got benzodiazepines there, and before I go any further, I want to scratch that out. The risks of giving patients benzodiazepines far outweigh the benefits, or certainly my, certainly my understanding is. And if I was going to do that, you must have set boundaries and really know your patients well. Two or three days, absolute max, and know what you're treating. Because they are anxiolytic, but of course they come with huge problems. Much more difficult to get patients off benzodiazepines than it is to get them off opioids. Patients, when they're withdrawing from benzodiazepines, can get... Uh, homicidal, um, they can get incredibly violent, uh, whereas those that are coming off opioids will feel horrible and they'll they'll really be unwell for a couple of days, but it's not gonna it's not gonna kill them and they're not gonna kill anyone else. Not to say it's gonna happen, but um, benzodiazepines are really dangerous. So PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, huge diagnostic criteria for the from the DSM four, but I'm just gonna give it to you in four brief. Um, um, ways of remembering it. There's a stressor. It's, a, it's an external stressor. stressor. It's a life-threatening stressor. They've got no control over it. So it's a natural disaster. It's being robbed. Um, it's being in a car accident. And cancer is actually considered a stressor that can cause PTSD as well. So patients living with cancer, surviving the life-threatening cancer. So a stressor. They get intrusive thoughts, intrusive recollections, flashbacks, uh, memories of that stressor. They avoid it at all circumstances and they become numb to the whole aspect. So the stressor, the recollection, they avoid it. And then they become hyper-aroused as well. So these are the features of anxiety. Can't concentrate, hypervigilant, anxious, irritable, angry, um, and those are the four aspects of PTSD. The treatment of PTSD is pretty good. Um, right at the bottom there, patients can get benefit years later. So if you've got a patient with PTSD, and we've seen a lot of trauma patients in the pain clinic, surgical patients, cancer patients now as well, treatment of PTSD can help years later. Um, Psychotherapy is a must. Pharmacology is probably a must as well. And there's something called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Now, I didn't really know what that was until I spoke to a psychologist, uh, psychiatrist about it. Is it's, um, they, patients do rhythmical eye movements and they look from one something to another. At that same time, they are rethinking and um, reprogramming their thoughts. It's quite interesting, but it seems to be out there and people seem to be doing it. The f important thing about PCSD is that these patients have got comorbidities. They've got depression. They've got mood problems. They've got um, anxiety problems as well. They, they, they drink. They may take substances as well. So you must treat their associated comorbidities to really get on top of the PTSD. Somatoform disorders. Um, 
again, took me a while to get my head around it, and it's probably going to change with a new DSM-5 um, uh, coming out soon. Symptoms and signs with no cause. So that's what it is. They come to you with complaints. You might find something, but you cannot find a reason for it. So that, in its simplest form, is what a somatoform disorder is. It's unconscious somatoform disorders, and there's a there's a conflict going on, as a psychiatrist would say, as the as the um, as opposed to something being consciously um, uh, formulated, and that's that's where you would call that's what you would call malingering or factitious disorder. So this is unconscious. So symptom signs, no cause, unconscious. And these are the four somatoform disorders, somatization disorder, conversion disorder, hypochondriasis, and pain disorder. So somatization disorder, these are the DSM-4 criteria. Starts younger than 30 years old. It goes on for years, and they have multiple complaints, four or more sites of pain on your body. they got two or more GI complaints, one sexual complaint, one pseudo-neurological complaint, and like all DSM criteria, no other cause, it's not intentional, so it's subconscious, and there's no substance abuse or other medical problems. Um, a study looked at uh, hospital admissions and primary care patients, and they found 9% of hospital admissions f um, f uh, fell into these criteria, and 5% of primary care patients. It's quite high. As I said, it could and is likely to change, so keep your eyes open. Now, somatization disorder um, is, and I'm just going to have to go through them one by one, experiencing communicating somatic distress. So this is um, Lepowski's um, uh, concept of somatization disorder. So they communicate somatic distress. There are no pathological findings. Um, there's no physical illness that, can, that could be attributable to these um, the symptoms couldn't be attributable to the physical illnesses or illness. They look for help, so they go out and actively seek help. It's unconscious, as I've mentioned, and it's, it's, it's um, uh, factitious. It's not factitious, so they're not making it up. Now, um, in 2009, this group had a look at somatization disorder to actually see if pain studies were using Lepowski's constructs, um, so his true definition of somatization. They found 116 articles that, f that fit the criteria. All the articles measured somatic features. Only four articles excluded a physical cause, only four out of 116. Only one uh, asked or found out if the patients were actually seeking medical help and no were looking for if it was attributable to a physical cause, so they didn't any ex exclude any um, uh, they didn't f attribute it. They didn't look if it was attribute if the if the complaint was looked for from a physical cause. C confusing. But a reminder what Lepowski's constructs were, um, and I've just mentioned them, and that's what they were. So these sixteen papers didn't go according to, didn't follow uh, Lepowski's constructs. So essentially, what this means is, and this is what the author said, is that we're psych. We're psychological. Uh, we're psychologizing um, physical complaints. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? So we're taking physical complaints and we're making them into psychology, which we're not, and we shouldn't be doing that. So Mirsky, um, in 2004, wrote quite a good. Um, I think it was a letter uh, looking at somatization and the word somatization and the way we use it. We as physicians, it could either mean somatization disorders. It could mean conversion symptoms, it could mean hypochondriasis, and it could just be um, symptoms of depression and anxiety. So we're using this word somatization completely incorrectly. And I hear it all the time as well. So in an exam, when you're going to use the word somatization, know what it means before you use it. And in, and in life, when you're going to use the word, know what it means. And it has been recommended that if a person has physical complaints, um, you should say they've got multiple physical symptoms, and that's it. And that's what we're talking about now with the new um, recommendation, the new recommended uh, fibromyalgia uh, diagnostic criteria as well. So that's what it is. They've got multiple physical complaints. Say it. Keep it simple. Now, conversion disorder, it's also a bit of a mouthful, but it is... 
there is a conflict going on. It's an unconscious conflict, and that is converted to physical symptoms. So they've got physical symptoms. They've got symptoms and deficits, motor deficits, sensory deficits, and these are things that you could control, but subconsciously, so coughing, um, uh, swallowing and pain, numbness, globus, globus hystericus, which is um, an ENT condition. It's unconscious, remember that. There's no other cause for it, um, and it causes distress and impairment. Conversion disorder. And then a pain disorder, which, which I still, I had a long chat with a psychiatrist about, and I, I couldn't get my head around it. And perhaps this is going to go from the DSM-5, so perhaps it's not that important it may not be that important in future but what it is what I understand it to be is pain in one or more sites and that's the main focus that these patients have a lot of pain in a lot of places well couldn't this just be a fibromyalgia type syndrome I don't I don't know how to get my head around those two pain causes distress impairment it happens to most of my patients um, psychological factors are important and again, it's unconscious um, because this is part of the somatoform disorders and it's not caused by anything else. So even uh, so, so to make it even more confusing, you can have psychological factors, yes. You can have psychological and general medical conditions, yes. These are most of my patients. Does that mean they've all got pain disorders? Well, I don't know. Um, and of course, to throw a spanner in the works, pain disorders can coexist with painful conditions. So... I've got a big question mark over pain disorder and um, this is certainly when you need psychiatrists involved if you're really thinking along these lines. Personality disorders. It's amazing how many people come with personality disorders or certainly um, odd personality traits. Uh, I had a lady recently with, she was clearly obsessive compulsive and it's almost like all I did was allow her to talk and vent for a, for 20 minutes and that's all she needs um, but I'm certainly getting the psychiatrist involved here because there's got to be some form of long-term goal so personality is is your emotions your characters your behaviors and how you project it onto the world whereas personality disorder is these are key words it's an enduring pattern of maladaptive behaviors there's a deviation from the social norm they're inflexible they're pervasive they're impulsive impulsive and inflexible and of course they've got difficulties in all aspects of life so they've got personal difficulties social difficulties um, difficult patients these in the community it occurs in about four to seven percent in the chronic pain setting thirty to sixty percent that is huge they're not fantastic papers of course I understand that but it just it shows you that these patients are around and they're around pain clinics quite a lot now there's the classification of personality disorders you get the cluster A, B and C and particularly the B and C are, are around in pain, in pain clinics so these are the ones that come that are associated with pain clinics the dramatic, the emotional which is the cluster B's um, and the anxious and fearful and I can think of at least three patients off the top of my head that have certainly strong borderline character traits if not the disorder itself and these patients are really difficult to treat and then of course the anxious and fearful well that just fits hand in hand with pain patients doesn't it on the whole and as I've mentioned I've got a patient deaf who's definitely obsessive compulsive and um, you've got this table this is looking at the incidence in pain in pain patients and they're high that's the bottom line they're high and it's common so think about it if you're treating these patients and they've got a personality disorder it's going to be difficult to, to, to get them having making forward gains uh, briefly we're almost there the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory I thought I'd mention it because we're talking about personalities and this is the gold standard to assess personalities um, and there's the website, there's a M MMPI 1, 2A, there are a couple. Um, it's copyright, um, you need to pay for it, it's, the, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge test, it takes hours to do, it needs to be marked and scored by somebody that's been trained in it, so this is very tightly controlled. And those are the, the 10 um, uh, categories. And I just wanted to briefly mention that. But studies have shown that the top three, um, I think it's called the conversion triad, 
hypochondriasis, depression, and hysteria. If patients have that, they've got higher pain scores, less satisfaction, poor outcomes. And they did a quite a good paper looking at students from the 1960s, I think it was. I think this was in pain. Um, and they had a look at the MMPI. And they looked at those with conversion triads and or the top three. And they found that those patients tended to have more painful uh, problems later in life, so 30 years down the line. Interesting stuff. And that leads us to the end of this lecture.